Well, hi everybody and welcome to the 2020 Vini Holmgren Environmental Poetry Prize announcement. So wonderful that you could join us. Um, I'd just like to start by acknowledging that I am and also Sue and David um, are on the land of the Jara people, the Jajorong spoken for country. And um, I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and future. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to um, elders of uh, the human variety and also the more than human variety. Uh, the elders of the magpies, the elders of the sedge grasses, the soil microbes and the wind. Um, and also to acknowledge that um, uh, this land, that, uh, the land of the Jarrah people is where Vini Holmgren uh, lived her last years of her life and also uh, the same country where she was buried. Uh, so uh, thanks again for joining us. So we have here with us today, um, uh, David Holmgren and Sue Dennett. So uh, hello to you in, down the road in Hepburn. <laughs> um, and also Janine, Janine uh, one of our judges. Um, co-judges with Michael Farrell, who uh, is not uh, with us at the moment, um, but hello to you, Michael. Um, uh, so I'm just going to hand over to uh, Vini's son, David, who uh, is going to say a few words about Vini um, and also about the prize. So welcome, everybody, and thank you, David. Uh, thanks, Meg. And uh, Sue's holding up a, a photo of my mother taken in her... Uh, 20s. Uh, she was born Lavinia Stella Rich in 1922 in York, Western Australia. And from all reports, she had a passion and a way with words from a pretty young age, even though she left school at 14 uh, to help her aging mother manage the household. Uh, those years are uh, recorded to some extent in her poetic memoir of her mother uh, amongst the sepias. And uh, here we have uh, Michael joining us, Michael Farrell. Uh, hi, hi, hi. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so um, Vini was very active in leftist uh, activism in her 40s, met my father through their membership of the Communist Party. And in the late 40s and early 50s, you might have heard her occasionally giving rousing speeches to Communist Party gatherings on the Perth Esplanade, uh, as documented actually in her ACO file. Um, and in the mid 60s, I recall her often acerbic letters to the press as an anti-Vietnam War activist that was also documented in a ACO file. In the early 70s, her writing and speaking mostly involved negotiations uh, with uh, suppliers and customers as a uh, bookshop proprietor. My parents ran the Realm Technical Bookshop in Perth in those years. And then after my father's death in uh, 19... 75 uh, were Vini's gypsy years, as she used to say, traveling solo in a camper van, which was the subject of her uh, prose travel memoir, uh, decades later, uh, A Sense of Direction, published in 2008. So the culmination of those gypsy years was her buying a 180 acre property on the far south coast of New South Wales, in 1979 and it was in those years um, her back to the land journey and uh, in uh, her late 50s early 60s that she began writing poetry mm -hmm. and those years were again uh, activist years involved in the campaigns to save the old growth forests of uh, her region, uh, but also very much connected with issues of ageing and uh, also her self-reliant living. I can remember in those years saying that she was through with causes, as she called her activist uh, 
work, but there was always um, another one she was uh, drawn into. But in those later years, she started to take the poetry very seriously. And I think her first uh, book of poetry was published in 1989, The Sun Collection. We don't have a, a copy of that, but Peasant in January very much sort of embodies those years living in the bush. Uh, when she moved to the uh, to Pambula, she continued and intensified her work in poetry and was very much uh, the performance poet, um, often reciting poems at uh, great length without reference uh, to notes. Her last years were here with us in Hepburn where she uh, penned her last book of poems while uh, living in our small cottage called the Tea House. And the Tea House poems uh, um, are sort of more very brief, more haiku uh, poetry. And uh, that was written just um, uh, a year or two before she uh, died. Uh, so she was a very strong environmental thinker. I remember it as sort of proto-environmental thinking in my childhood in, in the 60s, but it was really in those years when she was becoming a poet that was also uh, her greatest connection to the environment and her, her greatest passion about the issues. And the prize, this is the fifth year of the Beanie Holmgren Environmental Poetry Prize, established in 2015, the year of her death at 92. And it's grown considerably over that time. The first year there were 80 poems and uh, this year, 262. And I think all of those who knew, uh, knew her, Veni was a, a strong and a courageous woman. And the prize and indeed the, all the poems entered each year, a testament to Veni and the natural world that she loved to inhabit with her being and her words. So I'd like to thank all the poets um, who took the time to enter uh, poems. And I'd like to thank the judges, Jeannie and Michael for their thoughtful reading and uh, considerate selection. So without Further ado, I'd like to hand over to the judges to um, announce the, the winning poem and the two commended uh, poems. Thank you. Thanks, David. Thank you. Um, I would like to uh, thank uh, David and Sue, uh, Meg for hosting and Michael um, for as my co-judge. Um, I'd just like to say first that um, my name is Janine Lane and I belong to the Wiradjuri people from southwestern New South Wales. So I grew up on the Murrumbidgee River and had the privilege of being raised on country. I'm speaking to you today and um, I was reading these poems on somewhere else very special to me where I spent 30 two odd years before I moved to now Melbourne and now but I'm speaking to you today on the beautiful country of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people um Canberra um and on the same river that I grew up on as a child on the Murrumbidgee River and um mostly though I, at the moment I have the privilege of living and working in Nam on the greater Kulin nations of the Bunurong peoples I pay my respects to all elders past and present and emerging. It was a privilege to be asked to judge the, the Vini Holgan Prize this year, a prize in honour of someone truly admirable, particularly for her environmentalism and as a poet, as David said. Of the large um, volume of poems, also, to, as David said, 262 poems, uh, entered this year in the um, prize. Three in particular stood out to Michael and I as judges this year. And our reason for deciding on these three 
were that the, these three poets were speaking from a world inside that they've created and thought deeply about. And in each way, each poem speaks to a particular environmental concerns within a particular locale. And each poem is charged by the considerations and complications of a situation or a scene or a reality that they are in. And in this way, each brings its own insight to the fore. Of the three shortlisted poems were Anthropocene Poetics by Noemi Hunter, sorry, Hutner Kuros, Tracks by Ryan Dickinson, and Tulangi by Simone King. And the winning poem, we will give those a hand, yes. And um, the winning poem, after much deliberation, was Anthropocene Poetics by Noemi Hutner Kuros. Um, congratulations, Noemi. Um, Michael and I have citations for each of the poems. Um, Michael, would you like to read the commended, the short citations for the commended poems? Uh, yeah, sure. Or, yes, that would be nice. Thank you, Michael. Um, I added something. I don't know if you saw it. But... That's great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the citation for Tracks by Ryan Dickinson. This poem embodies what it's saying through its unusual immersive syntax, its speaker or I pronoun coming into and going out of you. Tracks is a listening poem. It's sl subtle, slow music, gradually bringing us to a place, a triumphant survival. The other commended poem, Tulangi by Simone King, is a beautifully lineated and sympathetic portrait of a kangaroo or wallaby mother in a context of eco-disaster, which leaves out the melodramatic human viewpoint. There is a note of real tragedy here, but no self-righteousness. Part of the power of this poem is its brevity and economy of words in capturing a scene that is both precious and precarious. Thank you, Michael. And now I'll share with you the citation for the winning poem, Anthropocene Poetics. This poem is set entirely within the locale of a suburban bus or tram. And the poem is impressive in terms of its scope, which brings in European history, popular culture, for example, references to Oprah Winfrey, Winfrey Australian history, all to the text in order to talk about human politics and breakdowns in communication. The poem def deftly brings in anecdotes from the speaker's own family in order to reframe what it is saying in terms of how animals and humans see, interpret, and read, and seek to understand each other. And congratulations to all three poets. I look forward to seeing your poems in print soon. Well, thank you, Janine, and thank you, Michael. Um, we've actually sent a link to uh, Noemi to see if she would like to join us to read her winning poem. So hopefully she'll come on uh, very soon. Let's see if she's in the waiting room. Not yet. I think there's a, a slight delay from when it's being broadcast. Um, no waiting room, she's not here. Okay, well, just give it another few moments to see if she would like to join us. She's a West Australian too, isn't she? Like there is a bit of a time thing. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Thanks. Oh, here she is. Hey. Hi. Congratulations, Noemi. Yeah. Thank yes. you. Yeah. Really wonderful. Uh, we'd love it if you would share your poem with me. Hi. Congratulations, Noemi. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Yeah
Congratulations, Naomi. Hi, everyone. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. Yeah, really wonderful. Uh, we'd love it if you would share your poem. Um, sure. No, would you mind turning off your, have you got the YouTube on at the same time? Would you mind turning that off? Feedback. Yeah. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. That was a strange experience, hearing my voice through the void. <laughs> <laughs> um, sure. Um, I'm on Wajak Noongar country in Bulu in Perth. Um, and I'll just get the poem up now. The man next to me on the train has a swastika tattooed on his left forearm. Three empty seats to my left. The man next to me on the train is wearing a green and yellow t-shirt of the Australian cricket team. The man next to me on the train catches me looking, checking, making sure my history isn't deceiving me. I avert my gaze, history tucked into a back pocket. English speaking, jeans made in China, op shop green Converse shoes, never seen a shtetl or a program, lives with a housemate on a diet of toast and bananas, third culture Jew. The man next to me on the train has other stuff tattooed on his left forearm, but they don't bear repeating, so I won't. A fascist on the Fremantle line. I hear grandma whisper something in my ear about how symbols chase, pounce. Questions for grandma. Do they chase us or do we chase them? Who do they pounce on? How hard? In this interspecies metaphoric paradigm, a fascist clawed or poured creatures. The day after the election, dad and I run a half marathon together. We cross the finish line, hands lifted to the sky in celebration. I am wearing my 350 t-shirt. By 350, I mean 350 parts per million. That is the amount scientists have agreed is the safe limit of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. When I was 16, I was obsessed with this number. Every time we pass a group of random people on the side of the roads watching the race go past, we go full performance spectacle. Dad and I walk and cheer and wave like we are champions. I hold my shirt out. Somewhere around the eight kilometer mark, Dad murmurs, yes, 350, that'll be a museum piece. Long gone now, 400, 410. The morning of the election, handing out how to vote cards at Morley Primary School. On the way, riding my bike through wired suburban tree-lined streets and white picket fences, feeling like democracy Oprah, every house I pass yelling, you get to vote and you get to vote and you get to vote. Democracy sausage smell wafting through the air through the facade of choice as we all line up to play the game. That night, watching the country becoming blue, magicians turn over cards, stupefied like we didn't even see him put one card behind his back, shuffle the deck, rigged like so, pick out more from his top hat. But I digress, detour, delineate, deliberate, devastate. The playwright at the panel on theatre and politics says artists shouldn't talk about their feelings in public political spaces. We don't want to hear it, stick to the facts, she says. But I'm sad, I want to yell. Aren't you? Dad is an agricultural plant scientist, goes to a meeting in Seattle and talks to other scientists about food security. How was it, I ask. The other scientists were mostly wheat experts, he says. Most wheat cycles last 10 years. They joked that we're three to six wheat cycles till the end of the world. Right. Feet dangling off the side of the wooden bridge at Bygup Wetlands, meaning place of rushes. The Derbyl Yerrigan River murmuring softly below. A yellow-billed spoonbill digs, digs, digs. Eduardo Cohn says all living beings think. Animals, plants, forests, spirits, all living beings forming habits, using signs to make sense of the world around them, of their world, that this pattern forming is what makes life a semiotic process. All life forms continuously engaged in appearing to one another in a process of sign making. 
that the tick differentiates between mammals and reptiles for survival, but not between a lion or a deer because it doesn't need to, that the anteater's snout is shaped like the burrows of the termites it feasts on, that pumas don't eat you if you're lying sleeping face up because then it sees another self, another being. Sign reading, sign making, misconstrued signs, misreading. I don't know what any of this means. Contradictions, interspecies love. They are just signs after all, as Fremantle fascist and I look at each other across three empty train seats. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Naomi, for, for writing it and for entering it into the Vini Prize and for reading it today. It's really, really wonderful. Uh, for those of you um, who would like to listen to it again, this is being recorded and will be available on the same YouTube link that you are watching it uh, on now. Um, uh, yeah, and also it's going to be on um, in the next uh, Rabbit Journal. So thank you, Jessica Wilkinson, for all of your help uh, and in co-sponsoring the Vini Prize. Uh, so Rabbit um, a Journal uh, for Nonfiction Poetry. So that's coming out, I think, mid-September. So you'll be able to read Nomi's poem and also uh, Simone and... Um, Ryan. Ryan. Thank you. Um, and also it's going to be on the Holmgren website. So holmgren.com.au as of Tuesday. Um, and again, with the two commended poems as well. Um, and that's it for today's presentation. So thank you again, Sue and David. Thank you so much for Janine and Michael um, and Carly uh, for our tech person and Osti backup. Um, and thank you to Nomi. Um, I think that's it. That's it for today. Would anybody like to say any closing words before we sign off? Mm, I thought that uh, Noemi, it's it's uh, just coincidental that you are in Fremantle. I understand. Um, I'm actually in in Bayswater, north of the river, but I spend a lot of time commuting to Fremantle. <laughs> <laughs> so then, David was uh, in Fremantle for quite a long time. So. You know, coming from Perth, Western Australia, Vini. We grew um, up on the Swan River at Bicton. Oh, right. Yeah. So it's kind of uh, ironic that um, that connection is is there. <laughs> it, it makes me teary, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> and I also wanted to acknowledge um, that Vini, with her last book, The Tea House Poems, when she moved to Hepburn, of course, when you move from your community um, of 16, 17 years, it's very difficult in your old age to make life start again in those very late years. And so the Tea House Poems is dedicated to Peter O'Mara, who is one of our local poets who Vini already knew and, um, and she had some contacts within the poetry community. So I wanted to thank all those who played a big part in Vini's latter years. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And it was lovely to meet you. Um, I, I hope best of luck with the Poetry Prize in future. It was a pleasure to judge it. Um, congratulations again to the winning poets, and I look forward to seeing them published in Rabbit soon. And Michael, where where are you? Uh, where are you, Michael? I'm in Fitzroy, looking over the <laughs> empty city. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. It's it's such a blessing. It is. Thank you. Okay. Take care, everybody. Good evening. Okay. Good evening. Bye. Goodbye. Take care. Take care.